In 1988, aerospace designer Brad Sorensen went to Norton Air Force Base for the annual air show. The show was the chance for aerospace companies and military contractors to show off new technology to top military and government officials. Brad wanted to network and maybe grab a new client or two. At some point, Brad got turned around and separated from his group. He hopped into another group and ended up in a large hangar watching a presentation given by a three-star general. At first, it was the typical rundown for various top secret aircraft. Brad figured he was in the right place. He wasn't. The general signaled to someone and a huge curtain was pulled, revealing three aircraft that nobody was expecting. When fellow aerospace designer Mark McCandlish called Brad to see how the air show was, Brad was silent for a long time. Mark asked him what was wrong. Brad sounded scared and depressed. He said, I think I saw something I wasn't supposed to see. Mark was confused. They both had top secret clearance. They worked for General Dynamics, Lockheed Martin, Northrop, McDonnell Douglas, Boeing, Rockwell International. They worked for- The usual suspects. Right. Now, as aerospace designers and illustrators, they often learned about experimental aircraft before they were even built. So what could be more secret than that? Brad said after the presentation, they pulled a curtain back to reveal three flying saucers, completely silent and hovering a few feet above the ground. Ah. Mark asked Brad to describe them. He said they looked like something out of the 1950s. They had a flat bottom, sloped sides, and a dome on top. And on the dome were small bubbles that looked like they contained cameras. The smallest saucer was about 24 feet in diameter. The next one was about 60 feet, and the largest saucer was about 120 feet wide. The general giving the presentation called them ARVs, or Alien Reproduction Vehicles. The nickname they gave the saucers was flux liners. In electromagnetism, electric flux is the measurement of an electric field through a given surface. So this was a bit of a hint. Next to the small saucer was a television playing various test flights. Video showed a saucer, or an ARV, hovering silently over a dry lake bed somewhere in the desert. Then the ARV did maneuvers that seemed like bouncing, and then finally the saucer stopped and flew straight up as fast as a bullet. The audience was stunned. Nobody had ever seen anything fly like this. Mark asked Brad if they explained how an aircraft could move in such a way. Brad said he was surprised at how simple the mechanics were. Mark said, wait, what, you got to see inside of the flying saucer? Brad said that next to the craft was a large easel which described the internal components. Plus the smallest saucer had some of its side panels removed so visitors could see the complete interior. Brad Sorensen saw the engine, the life support system, the crew area complete with jump seats and steering mechanisms. Mark McCandlish was blown away. And Mark, being a designer and illustrator, asked Brad if he could remember specifics about the saucer. Mark wanted to draw a diagram. Brad said he could remember and would tell Mark everything. But there was no way he was doing that over the phone. Brad Sorensen and Mark McCandlish met for lunch the next day to talk about the alien reproduction vehicles that Mark had seen at the air show. Mark wanted to try and sketch a diagram of what Brad saw. Both men worked in aerospace as designers and illustrators, so they were familiar with a lot of the technology and were trained to pay attention to detail. The first thing Brad noticed is that the ARV seemed kind of worn. They had chips in their paint, fingerprints, and smudges all over them. Clearly, the American military had this technology for a long time. Brad went on to sketch out and describe the interior of the ARV. The dome at the top is actually half a sphere. The crew jump seats are in the top of the sphere. The flat bottom of the saucer is a large capacitor array over a foot thick. On top of the array are oxygen tanks for the crew to breathe and to maintain air pressure within the craft. Then Brad revealed two bombs dropped by the three star at the air show. One, the saucer can travel faster than light. Wait, wait, what? And two, it uses zero point energy. Wait, what? Well, zero point energy would require its own episode to really get into it, but here's the gist. Zero point is the lowest possible energy that a quantum mechanical system can have. <sighs> Excuse did you just yawn? Well, that explanation did not help. Well, in classical mechanics, empty space is just empty space. But in quantum mechanics, no space is truly empty. There are fluctuating fields in constant motion, and there are particles that act like waves that wink in and out of existence. These fields and particles require energy to do that. 
energy that exists everywhere, even in the vacuum of space. For example, liquid helium at absolute zero in a vacuum is still liquid. You can't have liquid unless the atoms are in motion. Helium doesn't freeze because zero point energy keeps the atoms moving. Well, yeah, but how much energy could there actually be in, 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 in nothing? Well, physicists John Wheeler and Richard Feynman calculated that zero point energy in the vacuum of space is so powerful that the amount of space that fits in a coffee cup has enough energy to boil and evaporate all the oceans on Earth. A coffee cup. Well, if zero point energy boils away the oceans, we can refill them with the tears of oil company executives. And the politicians in their pockets. Eh, you're catching on. It was at this point where Mark McCandlish put his aerospace design skills to work. He converted Brad's rough sketch to a technical blueprint to scale of a functioning flying saucer. Over the next couple of years, Mark would perfect his drawing after speaking with other eyewitnesses who gave him more and more details. Wait, 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 more people saw this flying saucer than just the one guy? Oh yeah, many more people. After speaking with Brad Sorensen and studying his drawing, Mark McCandlish became fascinated with the ARV project and started doing his own research. As interesting as this was, it was still just a report from a single eyewitness. But the more Mark looked into the secret project, the more people he would find that saw the ARV, worked on it, and even flew it. In the early 1990s, Mark ran into Kent Sellen at an air show. A lot of action at these air shows, huh? There is. You want to check one out? Nah, I'm good. Kent was a crew chief working at Edwards Air Force Base. And one day he was sent out to repair a piece of equipment. And on his way to the job site, he passed a hangar with the doors slightly open. He looked inside and saw a flying saucer just hovering there silently. Now, without any prompting, Kent described the ARV exactly how Brad did. Flat bottom, domed roof with smaller domes that held cameras. And just as the initial shock was wearing off, Kent had a gun in his face. A voice told him to shut his eyes and get down on the ground. A bag was thrown over his head and he was dragged to an interrogation room for an 18-hour debrief. Verbal colonoscopy. Exactly. The aggressive military reaction didn't surprise Mark. What surprised him was, this happened in 1973, almost 20 years earlier. So how long has the military been sitting on this thing? Well, what happened? He says, well, this thing, you know, was flat on the bottom, sloping sides, a little ledge around there, and then a dome on the top with these little glass things on top. It looked like there was a camera under each one. And I said, really? He says, yeah. No, you know, no landing gear. Just, it was hovering. And I said, let me borrow your pen. So I took out a Kodak lens cleaning tissue package that I had in my camera bag it was the only thing I could think of to draw on. I just, I did a quick sketch of this alien reproduction vehicle as described by my friend Brad Sorensen back in 1988. And I said, is that what you saw? And he says, oh, you've seen one. And I said, no, oh, I, I, but I wasn't sure until this moment that the story was absolutely true. And so that was when I knew there was a second point of confirmation. In addition to Kent Sellen, there is at least one other person from the military who's been willing to go on record about the ARV. That uh, there was one facility at Norton Air Force Base that was close hold. Not even the, the wing commander there could know what was going on. And during that time period, uh, throughout my career, it was always rumored by the pilots that uh, that was a cover uh, for, in fact, a location of one uh, UFO craft. And the reason for that location was uh, folks that uh, could come out, land at Norton, play golf, uh, be part of a golf tournament and so forth, and during that process could go by the facility and actually see the UFO. Now hold on, so they would fly into a secret airbase, go see a UFO, and then uh, play golf? That's what the colonel said. That's a very military industrial complex, Bilderberg, Skull and Bones, Bohemian Grove thing to do. It really is. Throw in some ritual sacrifice and it would be perfect. All right, let's keep it nice. Hey, I'm just spilling the tea. The more Mark McCandlish asked around, the more people he found who knew about the ARV Flying Saucer project. The story really started to come together when Mark was introduced to Lieutenant Colonel Wendell Stevens. Colonel Stevens was a pilot who chased UFOs in the Arctic many years ago. Mark asked the Colonel, Hey, any chance you took photographs of something that looks like the craft I'm describing? Oh, please tell me there are pictures of this thing. There are pictures. Boom shakalaka! These photos were taken in 1967, so it would seem that the design changed slightly over the years. 
The only major difference between the 1967 ARV and the one Brad saw in 1988 was that the bubbles on top were larger in the older craft. Mark figured this was because cameras got smaller over the years. Cameras are now so small that we can assume that the current ARV models have even smaller or no bubbles at all. Mark McCandlish noted that even though there's a large variation in the shapes of the UFOs that have been photographed over the years, the general design is the same, round with a flat bottom, angled edges, and an upper compartment. Some UFO photos go back to 1950, so these vehicles have been around for at least 75 years, but they may have been here longer than that, a lot longer. In ancient Hindu and Sanskrit texts, there are many stories about Vimanas, the flying machines of the gods. The Mahabharata, written about 3,000 years ago, describes events that happened as far back as 5,000 BC, and Vimanas are mentioned quite a bit. They can fly at great speeds, fly into space, and even fly underwater. But what's really interesting about the Vimanas in the ancient texts is, the engines are described in detail. Strong and durable must be made the body of the Vimana, like a large flying bird of night material. Inside one should place a mercury engine with its iron heating device below. Through latent force in mercury, which triggers the buoyancy swerve, a man sitting inside can travel great distances in the sky. The Vimana's movements are such that it can climb vertically descend vertically, move forward and backward. With the help of machines, humans can fly in the air and celestial beings can come to Earth. In other passages and texts, Vimanas are described as having a mercury vortex engine. That's pretty specific. So a couple of questions. If mercury is in a cylinder and is then heated, will it circulate and cause a vortex? Yes, it will. But what if the Vimanas weren't using heat? What if they were using electricity like the ARV does? Will mercury circulate if a current is applied to it? It sure will. This technology was very interesting to Germany in the 1930s. You might be familiar with die Glocke or the bell. Die Glocke was about 12 feet high and nine feet in diameter. It used two high-speed counter-rotating cylinders filled with solutions of liquid mercury. The rotating mercury supposedly allowed the bell to defy gravity. We know that if you apply current to mercury, it will rotate. Reverse the polarity of the current, it rotates in the opposite direction. At this point in Mark's research, he was convinced the ARV project was real, and he began to unravel the mystery of its method of propulsion. In order to completely solve that piece of the puzzle, Mark would need to speak to people who claimed to have been inside a UFO. So, he started talking to abductees. Mark McCandlish spoke to several UFO abductees. Most of them remembered the aliens and the experiments they endured, but none of them remembered seeing the engine, except one. She said the craft she was on was round and in the center was a column full of silver liquid rotating very rapidly. And there was a wheel or device on the column that was rotating in the opposite direction. People who have found UFO crashes like the Roswell crash have reported seeing similar technology in the wreckage. And there are dozens of patents for anti-gravity devices and vehicles that use electricity to fly great distances at great speeds. Unsurprisingly, most of these patents appeared after Roswell in 1947, but a lot of the patents are built on the work of Nikola Tesla. Mommy. Between the many eyewitness accounts from military contractors and the accounts of alien abductees, Mark was able to discern how the ARV operates. The circular base was essentially a huge Tesla coil, multiple metallic layers stacked on each other with a slight gap in between acting as a capacitor to store and redirect electricity. Because the craft uses a lot of electricity, possibly a million volts or more, it generates a powerful electromagnetic field. By manipulating this field, the ARV pilot can generate thrust. The center column contains two counter-rotating cylinders of liquid mercury. The upper platform acts as an additional capacitor, working with the lower capacitor to allow the craft to move in any direction. The control system that the pilot uses is simple. With his right hand, the pilot has a lever which controls how much electricity is deployed from the capacitors. At the pilot's left hand is what looks like a large trackball. This control sends power in any direction, 360 degrees. Oxygen tanks and the life support system is attached to the lower platform. The ARV has no windows. It uses what's called a synthetic vision system. The cameras on the exterior of the vehicle allow the pilot to see. 
These cameras work in conjunction with each other and send separate feeds to the pilot's left and right eyes so he can see in three dimensions, like how a VR headset works. That's the entire thing in a nutshell. There's not much to it. Aren't you forgetting one thing? What? How the hell do these things go faster than the speed of light? Ah, right. That's where it gets really fun. The ARV is a vehicle that captures, generates, stores, and redirects a tremendous amount of energy in a field around the craft. This field is manipulated by the pilot, which allows it to fly in any direction. But that doesn't explain how the ARV can exceed the speed of light. Or does it? A number of papers have been released by physicists within the last 20 or 30 years that explain how a craft like this could travel beyond the speed of light. The reason nothing can go faster than light is because as you go faster, your mass increases. The closer you get to light speed, the closer your mass gets to infinity. Oh, that's a lot of mass. It is, it's way too much. Zero point energy is everywhere and is responsible for the effects of gravity, inertia, and mass. So a vehicle that utilizes zero point energy, drawing it in from its environment, could theoretically reduce gravity and lower its mass. And the faster the ARV goes, the more energy it absorbs, the lower its mass gets. This is like the opposite of E equals MC squared. But the math shows that this process doesn't actually violate the laws of physics. In September 2000, physicist Miguel Alcubierre released a paper called The Warp Drive. He describes how a vehicle could go faster than light without violating relativity. What the vehicle does is compress space-time directly ahead of it and expand space-time directly behind it. That would allow the ARV to go extreme distances very quickly like to the edge of the solar system in a few minutes. Alcubierre's paper also describes how the vehicle at the center of this warp field would not experience any change in gravity at all. No matter how fast you accelerate or how sharply you turn, the bubble around you maintains the exact conditions you had when you started traveling. This would explain why UFOs can maneuver so dramatically. An aircraft moving at 7,000 miles per hour doing a sharp right turn would turn the human body into chunky salsa. Seatbelts wouldn't matter, your organs would be crushed by the G-forces, though you would stroke out before that happened. But using Alcubierre's warp drive, you don't feel any of it. You could literally accelerate at 100 G-forces and not spill your martini. Ooh, there's martinis on this flight. I figure if I'm traveling to another solar system, I'd like to be relaxed and a little buzz. Ooh, how did the stewardesses look? Ugh, uh, they're called flight attendants now. <sniffs> Pilots have reported that UFOs moving at extreme speeds do so without generating any noise or any exhaust of any kind. UFOs have been said to generate energy out of thin air. Well, that's because they do. Now, what is zero point energy? I'm gonna show you a different, many different de definitions, but let me quote Nikola Tesla. Quote, throughout space, there is energy. Is this energy static or kinetic? If static, our hopes are in vain. If kinetic, and we know for certain it is, then it is a mere question of time when men will succeed in attaching their machinery to the very wheelwork of nature. Many generations may pass, but in time our machinery will be driven by a power obtainable at any point in the universe. And so there, ladies and gentlemen, is the basic birth of the concept of zero-point energy. The reason it's called Alien Reproduction Vehicle is that it's based on the study of extraterrestrial vehicles, but it is manufactured by human uh, military intelligence aerospace contracting arrangements. Uh, and this is very important. It means that we, Homo sapiens, have the ability to access this so-called zero-point field of energy, which the, is the ambient field of energy from which all matter and energy is fluxing, and can access that energy and generate all the power we need to run this planet without fossil fuels or pollution. Most of the information in today's episode comes from a documentary created by filmmaker James Allen. It's called Zero Point, the story of Mark McCandlish and the Flux Liner. If you're interested in this topic, and how could you not be, I'll link to the full doc below. It's 90 minutes of jaw-dropping stories. But... Damn it, I thought we were gonna get by without a butt today. Did you really? <sighs> no. But how much of the story is true? Well, even though we have eyewitness testimony of the ARV, aka the Flux Liner, aka the Flying Saucer, 
It's still just testimony. We don't have physical evidence. We have pictures. We do have pictures of saucers, that's true. We know that most are hoaxes, but there are a few that haven't been explained. As to the science behind zero-point energy, there's not a consensus. It's a relatively new field of study. Relatively nice. Some physicists believe zero-point energy is real. The math works. But some physicists are more skeptical and can still get the math to work without zero point. Even if zero point energy is real, and I believe it is, Mark didn't really know how the ARV captured the energy. Maybe it can be absorbed through the vehicle's magnetic field, we don't know. Well, it sure would be nice to have the Tesla files that were definitely stolen by the FBI. Yeah, it would be nice to have that stuff. Now, as for the Mercury Vortex Drive, people have known about this technology for a long time. And really, same with zero point energy. We've known about that since Tesla, maybe before, but nobody has been able to get either technology to work. Ha! Excuse me? If anyone got free energy to work, they would be disappeared faster than you can say Exxon Mobil. Yeah, it would seem that whoever comes close to getting free energy to work, they suddenly come down with a case of severe bad luck. I've seen copies of um, inter-office um, correspondence among defense contractors that openly stated that they felt the technology was a fundamental enabling technology, that it, it had um, all kinds of different defense applications, but it also had a lot of serious civilian applications that would be beneficial to humanity as a whole, to the environment. It seems obvious that um, someone, perhaps a group, maybe some kind of a rogue civilization within our society has capture the technology, they're exploiting it for their own aims, and for their own interests, whatever those might be. There's not a, a sliver of doubt in my mind that it exists. The storyline basically is that there's a lot of work going on in the aerospace industry that would re indicate that we have black projects that have gone even darker. Stefan Marinoff was the leader of the European free energy movement. In 1997, he made tremendous strides in the technology. Before he could develop his first prototype, he fell out of a window. Dr. John Mullen, a nuclear physicist, used to work for McDonnell Douglas, one of the largest military contractors in the world. He died of arsenic poisoning in 2004. His girlfriend was originally a suspect, but she was found dead in her apartment shortly after. There are no more suspects. There is no investigation. There will be no trial. Dmitry Petronov invented a plasma battery that powered his home for 14 months. In 2010, he went to a bakery and was never seen again. Zachary Warfield was another inventor who developed his own plasma battery. Warfield visited Petronov to exchange information. That same year, Warfield died in a strange boating accident in Washington, D.C. Eugene Malove was a physicist and expert in cold fusion. He claimed he had a working prototype of a free energy device. In 2004, the day before he was to make a public announcement about his findings, he was beaten to death. Ari Degos actually patented free energy technology based on the zero-point field. In 2007, he was about to get on a flight to meet investors who were going to fund his research. He was found dead in his car at the airport. Rory Johnson created a cold fusion laser-activated magnetic motor that generated over 500 horsepower. He planned a public demonstration of four vehicles equipped with this magnetron motor. The U.S. Department of Energy placed a restraining order on this technology preventing publication. And though in excellent health, he died unexpectedly soon after. Mark Tomian, a physicist, patented technology called a star drive which uses zero-point energy very similar to the ARV. In 2009, he developed a working prototype. Shortly after, he died from an unexpected cardiac event. His research is missing. Stan Myers developed a working engine that ran on water. In 1997, he died from what was officially reported as a cerebral hemorrhage. This happened while having lunch with two potential investors. His last words were, I was poisoned. And remember I said that most of this episode comes from a documentary created by James Allen? He ruffled a lot of feathers doing his research, specifically at Lockheed Martin. And so, I, you know, I'm kind of mystified as why a lot of more people, a lot more people haven't picked up on this and like really and sort of like hammered on Lockheed or Grumman or whoever to say, are you guys really doing this? I actually called a, you know, a, a spokesman at, uh, at Lockheed and asked her straight up. Um, I'm like, so what's going on with your electric and program? And she's like, well, we're not at liberty to discuss those programs. 
And I'm like, really, why not? And she's like, well, it might threaten our competitive advantage. And I really wish I'd gotten that on film or mm -hmm. tape. Because uh, my next documentary, Tom, are you listening? <laughs> I want to do a um, sort of a uh, investigative documentary on anti, specifically on anti-gravity um, in the aerospace industry. Oh, I can't wait to see that new documentary. This kid is a hero. Was a hero. Oh, you gotta be f***ing kidding me. While still editing the film before it was even released, James Allen was diagnosed with an aggressive form of cancer. He was dead in three months. I'm so angry right now. That interview clip I showed was from six weeks before his cancer diagnosis. Did he look sick to you? No, he did not. Autopsy results revealed an unbelievably aggressive tumor that usually occurs in patients with cancer for years, not weeks. And his blood contained 12 heavy metals and radioisotopes at toxic levels. Manganese, beryllium, thorium, and uranium were found in his blood. James Allen never got to see his documentary released. And his next film, which would expose anti-gravity technology being pursued by military contractors, now that would never happen. This is a bunch of these government companies doing that. When are we gonna stand up and something about these Yeah, I know. Even Mark McCandlish was afraid. You've actually heard a couple different stories about people being shut down when they're trying to oh, implement this. Thing. Or killed. Or killed, yeah. I mean, there's there's many times I lay awake at night with my nine millimeter under my pillow, loaded, and I wonder why they haven't killed me. And I honestly did. Well, at least he made it, right? Tell me he made it. Did he make it? Well, oh, no. this past April, Mark was found dead in his apartment. Let me guess. He, he took, took his, his own, own life. life. Yep. Uh, you better watch your back, sport. I do. I honestly believe the only thing keeping me safe is all of you. I just hope that's enough. Thank you so much for hanging out with me today. My name is AJ, that's Hecklefish. This has been The Y Files. If you had fun or learned anything, do me a favor and like, subscribe, comment, share. That stuff really helps. And like most topics we cover on the channel, today's topic was recommended by you. Although you warned me to be careful with this one. If there's a story you'd like to see or learn more about, go to thewifiles.com slash tips. But please keep my personal safety in mind. And special thanks to our patrons who make this channel possible. Uh, I couldn't do this without you. I'm like, I'm like, thank you right near you. Thank you, patrons. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much, patrons. And look, if you'd like to support the channel, consider becoming a member on Patreon. Or buy something from the Hecklefish store. Uh, that's the Y Files store. Well, pop quiz. What sells more? T shirts with the logo on it or T shirts with my face on it? Well, I don't think that's really. Ha! It's the Y Files store. Whatever you got to tell yourself to get through the day, Chief. That's going to do it. Until next time, be safe, be kind, and know that you are appreciated. And if I don't put out a video next week, Come looking for me.